Welcome to the Debate at Geo8 podcast series. Today we'll be talking with Dr. Jeff Raby, a foremost expert on Australia-China relations. Jeff was Australia's ambassador to China from 2007 to 2011. After 27 years in the public service and on completing his ambassadorial term, he established Jeff Raby and Associates, a Beijing-based business advisory firm helping Australian and Chinese businesses run successful operations across cultures and borders, and informing public and private policy makers. Closer to home, he's a member of the University of Sydney's China Studies Centre Advisory Board. In 2015, Dr Raby was part of the Consultative Committee for the draft of Australia's National Strategy for International Education, something of great interest to the GO8. I'm Ron Candelars, a freelance journalist and producer, and throughout this series, we've been canvassing a range of topics touching upon the work of all the Group of Eight universities. They include the Australian National University, Monash University, UNSW Sydney, the Universities of Adelaide, Melbourne, Sydney, Queensland and Western Australia. In the studio with me is Vicky Thompson, the CEO of the Group of Eight. Well, firstly, Dr. Raby, China is our largest trading partner, despite the testy relationship between both countries following COVID, and that's unlikely to change. Who needs who the most? Oh, we need each other. It's a symbiotic relationship. And obviously, China is hugely dependent on Australia's natural resources, energy, agricultural products, uh, our universities uh, to educate uh, students overseas. But equally, as you said, China our largest market, and despite nearly three years of trade restrictions against Australia, Australian exports this year at $171 billion are at the record. Your 2020 book, China's Grand Strategy and Australia's Future in the New Global Order, points the way to getting Australia's relationship with China back on track. How do we do that? Well, I think, first of all, we have to uh, recognise that we are essential to each other. We have to have a very clear understanding that uh, we will pursue our own interests. But very much it's an old formula, one that really was spelt out very clearly by John Howard uh, back in the late 1990s. You remember that when Howard first became Prime Minister, the relationship went into a nosedive. Howard was the deputy sheriff. Uh, He was the only world leader to applaud Clinton sending two carrier fleets through the Taiwan Straits. And China then, uh, as of recent years, put us in the deep freeze to uh, register a great uh, displeasure with um, our behaviour. But Howard thought about this, went to China, visited, and recognised the tremendous opportunity in China for Australia, and came away with a formula which was basically acknowledge explicitly, recognise our differences, but do not let the differences define the relationship. We have huge common interests, and so it's to focus on the common interests uh, rather than the differences. And I think this is where the uh, Morrison government period uh, really went off the rails. They began to define the relationship entirely in terms of the differences, the issues that divide us, as legitimate as those issues are, rather than focusing on our common interests. And I think that brought it to the the very parlous state that we found the relationship in when the Labor government was elected. Now, there are other challenges, which I point out in my book, China is a growing dominant power in the region. It's not going to go away. It's going to become more powerful, more dominant, and more influential. We then have to work out how we deal with a power that doesn't share our values, doesn't share uh, the same assumptions about how the world should work and how we should organise our societies. And that's a diplomatic challenge. That's a huge diplomatic challenge. Uh, But we have to rise to it. And I think in many ways, if you look at, Penny Wong's speech this week at the National Press Club, she outlined a number of things I'd set out very clearly in my book uh, nearly three years ago, and that is we have to be very active and innovative in coalition building. We need to think uh, creatively how we can raise the cost to China of its bad behaviour, but equally do this in a very explicit, open and non-confrontational way and constantly remind China, as they do for themselves, we are pursuing our interests. Uh, It's become more complicated, of course, uh, in recent times with things like the elevation of the Quad to a summit level and, of course, uh, the AUKUS agreement. But that postdates the arguments I was putting forward in my book. But active engagement, bringing Australia much closer to ASEAN, 
and 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 linking our interests more closely with ASEAN uh, is, I think, a key to being able to navigate through this very complicated diplomatic space. How do you think China sees us? Do do, do they see us as a middle power in the Indo-Pacific region? How do they see us? Oh, very much a uh, middle power in in the region. They see us uh, in the past much less so as having been very active diplomatically. I always recall an anecdote when I first arrived in China's ambassador back in 2007, which is, I know, ancient history now. The foreign ministry took me to one side one day and said, what has happened to Australia in the region? Once Australia was a dynamic, innovative, diplomatic country in the region, you created APEC, you were big supporters of the whole PEC process, great advocates of open trade, regional, deeper regional integration. You, together with Indonesia, forged the Cambodian peace but also together with Indonesia, uh, developed the Bali process on people smuggling. And the list goes on and on. And of course, we worked very, very closely with China in helping them achieve their WTO accession. So they saw Australia in that period as being very active and very constructive in regional diplomacy, and they welcomed it. And they said to me, you do things we would like to do, but we can't, because if we would do these things, if we were to show leadership on these matters, uh, others, meaning the United States, of course, would would block them. So uh, I think their view has changed in more recent times. And one, I think they've seen Australia as being less innovative and less creative in regional diplomacy. But also, I think uh, matters like uh, AUKUS would uh, concern them that we are turning away from Asia um, and seeing our interests much more closely aligned with uh, the US and the UK, uh, essentially looking to the Anglosphere to support order in the region. And I think for the Chinese, this would be a very disappointing development. Jeff, you and I were involved in a dinner with China's Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs recently, and one of the, the recurring themes of that discussion and subsequent uh, coverage of that was really a desire by uh, by the minister to understand what went so badly wrong in his in in his view and we were asked you know what went wrong since 2016 i think was the sort of time period that he was looking at mm-hmm. and kept going back to that and jeff you gave a very interesting expose almost sort of where you've just come from then in terms of what where you think we went wrong or well, not no sorry not where we went wrong but where they might think we went wrong do you think that they are placated by the response from the Australian government and us, or do you think we're in this completely new paradigm now where we can't look at what went wrong or didn't go wrong, but we're now in this new environment? Yeah, I think it's a good, good, good question. That's a hard one, obviously, to answer. But let me let me have a go in this way. I, I First of all, that dinner was very struck by Vice Minister Ma, how genuinely concerned and disappointed and sad, he sounded, about where the bilateral relationship got to. And I think that is a genuine sense of loss. Uh, He, after all, was uh, ambassador to Australia. Uh, He's been involved in Australian affairs on and off for a big part of his career. Secondly, I'd say that they worry about how the relationship can be improved uh, and de-risked at the same time. Uh, I think that was a theme that came out through the the dinner. Um, But it's quite clear that China decided before the last election to set about improving the bilateral relationship. Uh, I think the element of risk is is the main constraint at present on how quickly they're prepared to move forward. But also, I think, um, and I've made these points, you'll recall at the dinner, China has to look at its own behaviour as well. Uh, China did a lot to damage its standing in the world uh, with this wolf warrior diplomacy, as it's called, aggressive stance towards other nations, even friendly nations. They lost the opportunity to have a bilateral investment agreement with Europe uh, through really just bad behaviour by sanctioning uh, members of the European Parliament. Uh, Some of their language uh, directed towards Australia was just utterly unacceptable. And that has been a big problem. And China throwing its weight around the world in various places. South China Sea is just one of the number. Overall, all these sort of, if you like, assertive, aggressive behaviours by China have set back China's soft power enormously. And again, when I first went to 
Beijing's ambassador in 2007, people were rushing to go to China, rushing to be there, rushing to be part of this opening, uh, expansive experience. Uh, but that's all gone. And they're going to have to work hard. Do you think uh, we'll ever get that back? back? Do you think we'll ever go back to that? No, uh, not generally in terms of the view of China as an exciting, dynamic, uh, welcoming place. Uh, but equally, in terms of our bilateral relationship, I think trust has been severely damaged. Um, and the other element I was just going to make, Vicky, was that their application of trade measures against Australia were really counterproductive. It was a huge tactical mm-hmm. mistake by the Beijing leadership. They know that. I think that's why they're trying to walk backwards mm-hmm. without losing face uh, from uh, from uh, those those measures. And just just on your, your your point about where do we get back to, or will we get back to the previous period? I, I think I said the other night that they'll certainly never get back to an effervescent relationship the way it was. Um, but what's also changed is that in the last five or six years, the US has explicitly decided to treat China as a strategic competitor. And as Hugh White warned in 2012, when he wrote the book, The China Choice, if and when the US ever did that, it would have profound um, implications and consequences for Australia's relations with China and how we manage those relations. So I think, and I also made the point, I did on, on, the, on the dinner the other night, that once the US has made this its change, we now have to, both sides, China and Australia, have to work out how to navigate a much more narrowly constrained diplomatic place. It puts us the, in a very... The both sides has become much, much harder. It puts us in a very invidious position, though, doesn't it? And, of course, that's heightened with the uh, the prospect of AUKUS. And I'm actually heading to the States next week to meet with various US officials on the pillar two of AUKUS and the science and technology that will underpin a lot of that agreement and meeting with my counterparts from um, the UK and the US. How do you think the AUKUS is viewed from the China side? I think I kind of it's a rhetorical question. And and how do we manage that invidious position given we do have this in, incredibly, you know, huge defence agreement about to be sort of embarked upon with the very people that we we have to make, well, apparently, these choices with. It's complicated massively managing that relationship in this new constrained world that we find ourselves in. And as I said earlier, we've tossed our lot in with the Anglosphere uh, to try and um, support the US in maintaining order in the region. And Penny Wong made that very clear in her press club speech. Uh, the other day, I mean, her speech was effectively back to the old, all the way with the USA. So how China views um, AUKUS, uh, I think it's a number of different levels. First of all, the announcements of the last month um, would have been all factored in and discounted because AUKUS has been talked about now for 20 odd months without any substance. So eventually there's going to be substance put into it. Secondly, it's such a long term uh, out there project. Uh, it's uh, we of the never never. Some uh, some uh, with us uh, described it as it doesn't change the strategic balance. Certainly not in the next 15, 20 years. So it's no, if you like, strategic threat to China. And frankly, the number of submarines that we will acquire over this extended period, if in do, if in fact we ever acquire them, China will have helped constructed that number many times over in the same period, uh, assuming submarines are still a relevant uh, military option uh, that far out. So I think the problem with AUKUS, from my perspective, and I think the Chinese leadership would be unsettled by this, is that it's really a statement of Australia that we see the long-term stability of the region uh, being uh, one where uh, the United States is strongly supported by Australia uh, in advancing its interests in the region. So it really does put us firmly in the US camp. Jeff, one of the, if I can paraphrase some of your criticism of uh, uh, diplomatic efforts more recently, is that you know the Australian view on China has been that China changed, we didn't. It's up to them to behave differently. We're not going to give up our values and be pushed around. Some would say, what's wrong with that position, given that uh, China was pretty strident about the South China Sea, trade barriers, et cetera, all of those things. What's your essential 
concern about that approach by um, Australian uh, governments? Well, quite simply, it gives up agency. We surrender agency to China. We're saying there's nothing we can do. We are we are innocent victims, babes in the wood. Uh, feel sorry for us, and it's all up to China to fix. And I don't think that's the sensible thing for a sovereign country to be doing. Um, so it's about agency, and we have to look at our own capacity to manage more complex diplomatic relations, uh, which are going to get more and more complex and difficult and challenging in the future. So that's my my principal concern with that approach. However, it's actually not true. Once the United States, about 2015, uh, clearly defined and categorised China as a strategic competitor, we changed as well. And the change has been on both sides. Uh, And so, um, I mean, it's cause and effect. Who knows? The reality is, for many years now, we have uh, drawn closer and closer to the US in treating China as a strategic competitor. And we've done that without asking some basic questions. What sort of threat is China to Australia? Now, it certainly is a threat to US primacy. And the US treating China as a strategic competitor is all about US uh, retaining primacy. But is it for a third country like Australia to uh, see our interests aligned and connected directly with US primacy? Certainly ASEAN does not see that that way. And in the last week or so, Kishul Marabani, the former Singaporean uh, Secretary of State, um, Foreign Secretary rather, uh, made a very interesting observation that we in Australia have decided to go a different way, a different direction from ASEAN uh, in its relations with China in a way that we have basically given up on ASEAN as the key strategic partner in balancing China and pushing back on China uh, to relying on um, a non-present UK and, of course, the US, which is uh, uh, pursuing its primacy over China uh, rather than uh, regional balance. The other point I want to pick up too is that I noticed in some of your writing there seems to be a, a subtle difference in the way you see the approach of Penny Wong as foreign minister compared to the approach of Albanese as as prime minister. Uh, Could you speak to that? Well read. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks. Uh, Yeah, look, um, yeah, to me, sort of, uh, um, Albanese uh, has never had a foreign policy background. He's not invested, uh, he's invested hardly any time in these issues, which require actually an enormous amount of engagement. He has basically taken a script from uh, uh, his national security advisors um, and, and, and followed that. And the best example of that was when he um, was probably a little bit overwhelmed by the occasion in Madrid for the NATO meeting last year where we were one of a number of add-ons. And he started talking about a single NATO theatre, meaning that uh, NATO would be aligned against China as well as against Russia. And the NATO partners certainly don't have that view of NATO. And uh, a number of European leaders made that very clear. So it's things like that. Whereas Penny Wong is much more subtle in her approach. She has done a very credible job in rebuilding our relations uh, with the Pacific, uh, worked very hard on ASEAN, except that in her case, the fundamental issue is that before the last election, Labor Party, to avoid being wedged, by the, uh, by, the, by the coalition on national security made Labor's foreign policy and security policy indistinguishable from that of Morrison, and they're stuck with implementing it now. Mm. You know, from, from August, from elevating the quad, everything we do, uh, which uh, uh, you know, is basically implementing Morris's, uh, the former Morrison government's foreign policy because they, they tactically didn't want to have... Uh, uh, any opportunity of being uh, attacked on being soft on national security. That's where we find ourselves. Now, I think Albanese doesn't really get that, in my view, and certainly I think Penny Wong does, but she's got to manage, uh, if you like, uh, one of those unpleasant sandwiches. Mm-hmm. So uh, imagine then you're, you're back as ambassador to China for the Australian government and you're giving advice to this current government about a middle path, a, a new way of dealing with uh, China and America in these, you know, geopolitical times. Uh, what would you be advising? 
Well, God forbid I'd ever go back as, as ambassador. <laughs> I, I, I'm not Kevin Bright. <laughs> um, look, no, my, my best advice is the advice I can give outside of government. And essentially, I think we need to define a much more independent foreign policy stance. We need to bring ourselves much closer to the way ASEAN balances its interests both with the United States and with China. I think Penny Wong and the government have done a lot of good things with China. Uh, they've got discipline now on the rhetoric. I mean, the last government was, was, was shocking, the way ministers would just shoot off at the mouth over major uh, relationship, like the relationship with China. Uh, so there's good discipline amongst ministers and cabinet. I'm very careful uh, uh, not to uh, make China a whipping boy. There's control over the rhetoric, uh, language and so on. So all of that's very good. I am sure the trade disputes will be resolved in coming weeks, if not months, and we can start to step back towards a more normal relationship, which is clearly being flagged by both sides. So we need to be clear to China about where we stand on, on issues that divide us, but then go back to the old Howard formula and move on to identify the things that the that, that unite us or that we have common cause and purpose in. But we also should be very active in engaging China in a, in a range of multilateral areas where they have an interest. We should definitely support China's uh, admission to the um, uh, Comprehensive Trade Agreement, CCPTT, if I've got the acronym correct. And, 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 and of course, it's not our decision at all uh, by ourselves. It requires consensus of all members and China has to come up to the level of obligations that already exist. If both things happen, Australia should be an enthusiastic supporter of China joining. We have always welcomed China into multilateral forums as part of our long-term strategy with managing China to tie it into the multilateral system as much as we can, or the regional systems of, of rules. So we should be doing that. There are new creative things. We should talk to China about uh, disarmament in the region, try and, try and uh, promote new activity around these areas of um, conflict and security. We, as the biggest energy exporter in the region, and China as the biggest energy importer, should be working on a regional framework of energy security. There's a whole agenda that can be pursued jointly and constructively with China that they would be prepared to engage in. But we have to get the bilateral relationship back to a normal level before we can probably have these discussions. And I think that recalibration that you mentioned has been recognised certainly from the China side, and that's apparent in the rhetoric that we're now seeing. Can I just bring you to my world, and that's universities, for a moment? So our universities, the Group of Eight, we have an incredibly strong relationship with both research and, uh, and students. And whilst the rest of the sector over COVID as it relates to Chinese students dipped we actually increased our numbers with Chinese students. And not only did we increase them, but we held on to students over a very long period of time. And the Chinese government made significant concessions to enable those students to stay and study with us. So I think now we've got over 70% of all Chinese students at university in Australia are at our eight universities. And importantly, in terms of the research relationship, we are now, uh, that is our fastest growing um, area. And you talked about, you know, the security relationship. Of course, we got caught up in all of that, that palaver mm -hmm. <laughs> um, with the previous government that any research with China was not good. Yeah. And of course, you know, we're not doing sensitive research with China. We're doing, you know, we do that with our Australian eyes only or with our five eyes partners. But there's a whole bunch of research we do in the humanities and social sciences and health, et cetera, clinical medicine that's really important. So from our perspective, I'd like to think that we're kind of getting over that hump that not all engagement with China is bad. But our relationship did sustain a very tricky and difficult time and has continued to. I'd be interested in your observations of why you think that is and was the case. Do you think that will continue for our universities? And then in the domestic context, it's not always seen in a positive light. And in fact, I, I spoke to a, a, a joint committee of uh, parliament yesterday and this issue was raised by some that 
you know, there are some uh, racist elements, frankly, to our, our international students and to our Chinese students. So there's a lot to unpack there. I'm, 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 I appreciate that, Jeff, but I'd be really interested in your, your thoughts on that. Well, I think uh, one of the great lessons we can take from how well the university sector uh, managed um, managed uh, the relationship with China through the very difficult, the very difficult period politically in the bilateral relationship, but also the shock of uh, the external shock of uh, COVID, uh, is the way the sector kept dialogue, connections, linkages, discussions, and relationships going. After all, the bedrock of doing anything with China are personal relationships. I know it's cliched, uh, any any business conference will come out with this, but it is actually, in fact, the reality. You do need to have those very strong personal relationships. And so I think the university sector, a group of eight, but beyond that, you know, can really congratulate itself on both sides that you had built such strong and resilient relationships, you are able to withstand some of these quite powerful body blows that the um, that the relationship uh, has received. So I have a lot of confidence in that and going forward. And I also think it's a lesson for the broader relation more generally. And I, I think that will continue to, to, to grow and develop. And look, on sensitive things, uh, national security related stuff, you just have to be very upfront with the Chinese where the limits are. They have their own limits. We have ours perfectly legitimate. Mm. Get them up, but we have to be clear about it. Now, there may have been a degree of naivety amongst some areas of the higher education research sectors uh, in the past, but that's gone, and I don't think that will ever come back. But we must, in terms of Australia's national interest, and when you're talking to parliamentarians, I think always these things must be expressed in terms of our national interest. In terms of our national interest, we can't not engage with the Chinese uh, higher education and research sectors. We simply cannot. I mean, the amount of investment that goes into China uh, compared to our capacity to invest, we need to have collaborative, constructive arrangements. Well, we'd just be left behind uh, if we didn't. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Yeah. And, 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 and it's absolutely in Australia's national interest. Mm. So I think if I could give you gratuitously any advice, Vicky, it's, I'm sure you're doing it. It's the teaser always. Um, how Australia benefits from these sorts of relationships. I mean, the media, the ranters in the media, and we know who they all are, love to paint these relationships as a one-way street. We're being sucked dry by the Chinese. They're taking everything from us. We're suckers. We're gullible. It's a script, you know, you, you, you can repeat in your sleep. Mm. But it's not true. These are two-way streets. Uh, we're not naive and gullible when we deal with China and these things. We will have limits in certain strategic or, 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 or defence areas, um, and that's as it should be. But as you say, you know, so much of medicine, so much of the humanities, the arts, whatever, we can only benefit from that, that relationship. I suppose also, Jeff, it points out that, you know, we had a moment where there was hardly any relationship between governments, but it was the, uni it was the university sector through its work that maintained this soft power and, and some sort of dialogue. Absolutely. And 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 I, I think we have to uh, recognise that that's been an extremely uh, uh, important thing for Australia uh, as a nation in terms of maintaining um, uh, some connection with a very major player in the region. But I also want to put a plug in, if I can, for my pet hobby, and that is um, uh, cultural relations. We, we cannot go hard enough on, on, on the cultural relationship. And if we do that, each side will stop seeing each other in stereotypical ways and we'll start to deal with each other as we are. Interesting, complex, engaging, friendly, uh, non-racist um, people on both sides. So the cultural dimension, I think, is extremely important. And that probably faded away a bit in the last few years. Uh, it was, certainly needs to be uh, redoubled our efforts in coming years. Well, Dr. Jeff Ravi, we'll have to leave it there. Maybe we'll have to get you back for a, a, another session because there's so much more to talk to, but so much. Uh, thank you so much for your time today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for your company today. If you'd like more information about the issues raised in this podcast or other related topics, please visit our website at go8.edu.au. And a quick reminder, 
that you can always tune in to the debate at GO8 on Spotify, Google, Apple, or YouTube. Bye for now.